Hello and welcome to this week's special episode of Future of XYZ. Uh, with us today is um, a colleague and friend who also happens to be the executive director of Doctors Without Borders, uh, Avril Benoit. Um, Avril, thank you so much for joining us on Future of XYZ. Glad to join you today from Golma in North Kivu, which is one of the uh, war-torn eastern provinces of Democratic Republic of Congo, where I happen to be on asylum, uh, assignment, but normally I'm based in New York City. Um, well, I, can't, I we have to, we have to talk about why you're in Congo and all the places that you have been deployed in the last six months, despite being executive director. And I think it goes to bear witness to the conversation we're going to have on the future of humanitarian aid, which has a lot to do with the present state of humanitarian aid, where there's so much need in the world. Um, you started your career as a journalist. You're, you're Canadian. You spent 20 years at the highest echelons of, you know, the, the journalistic media landscape in Canada before in 2006, joining what is called globally Médecins Sans Frontières, so Doctors Without Borders, or MSF as it's more commonly known in the field. You started in the field as a project manager. You've been deployed to South Africa, Mauritania, South Sudan. You were a head of mission before becoming director of communications going back to those journalistic roots uh, at headquarters in Geneva. And now you have been since, you know, mid-2019, the year before the pandemic, the executive director globally. Um, I think, you know, you, you are very well poised, besides the fact that you are currently in Eastern Congo, to talk about the future of humanitarian aid. But I do want to ground us first, uh, Avril, in what what is humanitarian aid, first and foremost? Right. So, and and just to to explain, I am executive director of Doctors Without Borders in the United States, and we are a movement. So it's a it's a global organization made up of of people who are not especially hierarchical, and so we can all pitch in on the ground now and then. Um, but but our core purpose as a humanitarian organization is to save lives and alleviate suffering. So this just goes back to some of the foundational ideas of what humanitarian action is there to serve. And it's really primarily in conflict zones, although, of course, we do uh, intervene a lot of the time in natural disasters and in long-term chronic situations um, where uh, maybe there are vulnerability pockets or gaps in healthcare provision that we think are so acute, so urgent, um, that we feel compelled to intervene. So uh, humanitarian action is not solving problems on a large or deep level. Uh, so here in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, we're not a peace building organization. We're not doing mediation between the warring parties. Uh, we are not doing long-term economic development. That kind of work requires a real specialization, a patience, a lot of um, bringing people together, uh, community building, um, capacity building, uh, it can take a really long time. And humanitarians say, yeah, fine, do that. But at the same time, let's save lives. There are urgent needs. People are dying. They have a right under international humanitarian law and most people's good conscience to access what they need to survive in a conflict zone or a terrible situation. And so the humanitarians are there to to address those immediate, urgent needs, generally speaking. That makes a lot of sense. And 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 the immediacy of it also speaks to the short termism when you hope that a government or other organization steps in for the long term solution building. Um, ah. Yes. Uh, and in a place like this, though, the conflict has been going on for 30 years. Right. And so humanitarians like us have been responding for 30 years. And we have some very long term projects that have been in locations that at times are it's stable and the warring parties are kind of backing off. Maybe there's some band of a tree, but for the most part, you can remain. And then all of a sudden, a group like the M23 has a resurgence. Um, and there's a lot of conflict. They take control. Uh, and uh, the army, uh, UN peacekeepers, more than 100 armed groups, uh, some of them little self-defense groups, some of them uh, backed by foreign powers, um, they all start clashing. 
And because we have had that presence with the population, they can give us some assurances that they really want us to stay when things really heat up, when things start to get violent, when there are injured, uh, and all the other medical things that need to continue going on, like delivering babies safely, uh, sexual reproductive health, vaccinations, all the, all the regular things must continue. And so by having a long-term presence, even in a place that's volatile, uh, you can be in a much better position to respond when it explodes. Well, I, I mean, this is your seventh deployment, if I've read correctly, to the Congo, to the Democratic Republic of Congo since 2009. So to your point, this conflict is ongoing. The IRHC, you know, the International uh, Rescue Committee says that, in fact, this is um, this is, you know, 100 factions warring. And, and and the resurgence, and I think this comes to, I want to talk about, you know, kind of both the mission that you referred to earlier of Médecins Sans Frontières, but also really specifically, I mean, e e Ebola is coming back, malaria, measles, like when there is conflict in people's basic needs of housing, shelter, you know, food, water safety, et cetera, reproductive health, you know, there are health crises that emerge. And I think, you know, the 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 group Doctors Without Borders was founded in Paris, ergo the Médecins Sans Frontières, in 1971. Over the course of those 50 years, a lot has happened and a lot has changed. I want to get to that, but your organization was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1999. I want to understand a little bit specifically, like Congo or anywhere else, what is the basic mission? How does it function? And how are you different and or collaborative with other aid organizations such as, you know, uh, UNHCR or IRC or Red Cross or UNICEF or, 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 or. There's so many, Mercy Corps, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are many, uh, and we are all colleagues in this. Uh, and MSF is different, and I'm using the acronym for Médecins Sans Frontières as we're known internationally. Uh, we really try to um, stay with medical humanitarian action. So in many places, there may, might be a need for water and sanitation. Well, we would say, yeah, we can do that because it's it, it, if you don't have water and sanitation in uh, a refugee camp, for example, you are going to have the risk of cholera or other diarrheal diseases. Um, we also have uh, second to the medical humanitarian action uh, as the central sort of core identity. This second aspect which really does um, make it unique and was the kind of thing that drew me into the organization as a, as a, when I was a journalist and I would do interviews with people from this organization that I eventually joined. I was just so thankful that they were straight shooters and that they were willing to bear witness. They were willing to denounce and be very clear what they were seeing, what the needs are, uh, all the kinds of things that some other organizations cannot do. So even a UN agency has to respond to the needs, expectations, and political demands of member states. Yeah. It happens. It happened to the World Health Organization during the Ebola outbreak of 2014-15, um, where they were told, don't declare it an outbreak because it's bad for the economy and uh, you'll lose your access, your insight and things like that. And we criticized them openly. We were one of the first organizations to do so because we were on the ground responding with all the experience we have responding to outbreaks. And so this aspect of, of bearing witness is partly possible because we are financially independent. Yeah. A lot of the other organizations you mentioned are either UN, so they have a formal mandate, or they are non-governmental organizations that rely heavily on donations from governments. So in our case in the US, it's USAID mostly. And governments sometimes the put- The Agency for International Development. Yeah, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to irritate your donors. You don't want to be criticizing your donors where in our situation, if US policies are harming people at the Mexico border, as they are trying to assert their rights to claim asylum, uh, we will we can say it. Whereas maybe other organizations have to hold back a little bit. If we think that reproductive health care includes access to safe abortion care, we say it. 
And if we lose some private donors, okay, they, you know, if they can make that choice. Um, but we are, we're independent. Um, and that's, that's one of the key features that gives us the freedom of expression, if you will, the voice that we have. And we have so many donors around the world. I think we have maybe seven, seven million supporters all around the world. Um, but we don't take funding from any government that's a major belligerent, which leaves us pretty much with Switzerland. <laughs> I, I, um, you know, I think I read that the operating budget is in the ballpark of, you know, uh, just under two billion dollars annually. Which, when you think about all the ninety countries or so that you are operating in, and the growing uh, crises, as we look, as anyone reads the news, I mean, you mentioned the U.S. Mexico border. That is, you know, just one small fraction. I mean, just in the last six months alone, you're currently in the Eastern Republic of Congo. You are in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the east. You've been in the Ukraine for a month. You were in Haiti before that. You've obviously overseen the response to the earthquake that that shook literally and metaphorically uh, Turkey and Syria, which is already coming out of war. You have, I mean, Yemen, you have Ethiopia, you have Burkina Faso, you have Afghanistan. I mean, the 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 lift is is overwhelming, frankly spoken. Um, $2 billion operating budget does not seem like a lot. I have to be honest. Um, what are some of, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, how, especially when you think of the budget of one hospital in New York City. <laughs> I, I mean, mean, we run a fairly lean operation, I can assure you. Well, and a lot of that comes from lo having local staff, which, you know, I'm not going to get into. Obviously, there were some criticisms within of a two tier system. There are always going to be criticisms. I don't want to focus on that in any way, but I do feel obli obliged as a journalist in this sense to call it out. But I think one of the things that's really important is having locals right on the ground. Not only is it cost effective, but they also, to your point, they speak the language, they understand the customs. And when you're talking about medical care and health care, it feels to me that that is a very important component of providing good care and understanding what care is required. I mean, if you're talking about Muslim country, you know, or a Hindi country, they are very different, you know, rules and regulations than if we're talking about a Christian nation, even though religion shouldn't qualify it, but it is their cultural customs and norms. How how do you manage as an executive director and as an organization that is operating so broadly on kind of a shoestring, providing such important care? How over the course of time, as these conflict zones and climate change issues and everything else are kind of, I think, accelerating. How, how do you guys anticipate the future of humanitarian action? Yeah, well, if you look back to the beginning when you might have had a, a ragtag group of French doctors uh, loading medical supplies onto donkeys to go across the Khyber Pass and uh, reach isolated areas of Afghanistan and you would lose sight of them for six months. Well, now things are completely different. Um, it's true that uh, things have evolved tremendously in terms of the composition of the staff. First of all, it's not volunteers anymore. Uh, we hire people with experience. They're not uh, aid workers with real credentials and years of experience. And the international mobile staff never make up more than 10% of any operations. So here in Congo, where we have staff who have been here for a very long time, this is actually one of the major uh, countries where we do international recruitment. So more than half of my international mobile colleagues are actually from places like Congo uh, or Haiti. And then so the it's no longer white Western, uh, white colonizers from Europe. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, the, we have a, a, a history in the aid sector, generally speaking, of, you know, anchoring and historical roots in a colonizing mindset. Uh, and things are shifting fast. And that's a pressure that we are putting on ourselves. There's also a tremendous attention now, as there should be and should always have been, on the needs of the local population, accountability to the local people being taken into consideration. Because we come along, it's not about religion so much as maybe our Western model of medicine. And we come in and we say, all right, right. You got to do this and this and this because we know we're the experts. Well, now it's much more of a conversation. It's a discussion. And our number one local partner in any place we work typically is the local Ministry of Health or Department of Health. 
Um, even even now, we've got a situation of a, a measles outbreak in the camps. Uh, unvaccinated children really needing serious care when they get sick. And none of the hospitals in this capital region were providing free care to displaced kids from the camps who have whose parents have no money. Um, and so what we're doing is we are partnering with a local hospital to run the measles ward, a pediatric measles ward that'll have the oxygen and all the bells and whistles to be able to provide quality of care. And while we're there, we're, we're in a partnership with a local hospital. And that is often how it works. Now, the arrangement is we rent the space and we hire the staff and we probably are also going to be paying incentive uh, payments to the Ministry of Health staff who maybe haven't been paid in many months. So uh, all around, it, it becomes uh, quite a, a tight partnership of, of convenience and necessity. I, I mean, convenience and necessity are so important. It's what you came back to in the beginning in defining this. I mean, there is an urgent need and how you get that solved is is really material to the impact that you then can have. Um, one of the things that you mentioned about is bearing witness. I think it's a, the core tenants, and you started to talk about this a little bit, of Médecins Sans Frontières as an organization that is unique because of your funding model, but also because of, you know, just the, the premise on which you were founded is independence, impartiality, and neutrality. So you can, as you say, speak up against women's reproductive rights being taken away wherever that might be happening or, you know, denial of asylum seekers or, you know, children being denied education or being transferred across borders or whatever it may be. But again, coming back to where you've just been in the last six months, I mean, whether you're talking about like gang, you know, riddled, you know, you know, post post hurricane, post assassination, Haiti, or if you are in the Ukraine, of course, where you are talking about tens of millions of displaced persons, um, you know, these are all and now in Congo or anywhere else. I mean, how how fundamentally do you remain impartial um, and neutral and independent? Um, how do you do that? It's not that I don't have an opinion or that we all don't harbor certain judgments about what we see. Uh, in Ukraine, for example, when you're working on the Ukraine side of things, obviously the patients that you're treating and the organizations that you're supporting uh, are being pummeled. Um, and if there's... Um, a violation of international humanitarian law, for example, a hospital being bombed, we are going to say something. And we are going to say something because um, people, civilians in conflict should never be targets. Certainly hospitals and other uh, civilian infrastructures should never be targeted. And so we do that in a, a, a way that is neutral uh, only insofar as we will speak about the things that we see directly. Uh, we will speak for the suffering that the patients uh, or the pe populations we're helping, people we're helping uh, are experiencing. But we're not going to make uh, any sort of uh, recommendation about who should win this war, how it should end. We have no stake in it. We're kind of useless as far as the belligerents are concerned. Like we're not going to do that. Um, impartiality means that you try to work on all sides. So the Ukrainians say, yeah, come on in. Uh, here are the things that you can help us with. And we identified those things with them. Uh, and on the Russia side or Russia controlled side of, the, of that war, uh, we offered, we try to negotiate, we try to get access uh, and have not succeeded so far, really. So impartiality, though, means that you do make an effort to really look at the needs independently. So it's not Moscow that's going to tell us, well, just drop your boxes here and uh, get out of the way. No, we, we want to see for ourselves. We will do our own independent assessment. Um, and we will uh, treat the most sick, the ones who are most vulnerable, the ones who, who that we really feel there's an added value for us to be there. And so impartiality means really trying to work on all sides of a conflict. Uh, it means doing independent assessments. And neutrality is, in, in a way, just a, a tool. It's a lever. Yes, in Haiti, I had opinions about the gangs and who was backing the gangs and the political structure behind it, and it's hard not to notice. 
um, and to uh, realize that there are truly bad actors in the mix. Um, so the neutrality then really comes into sounding the alarm, focusing on the people you're trying to help, um, and maybe more in bilateral conversations with a gang leader, for example, you might say, hey, stop coming into our hospital with your weapons to take out our patients that you're trying to kill outside the hospital. And, you know, we might have, you know, we're not going to do that in public and the media, but we're we're definitely going to tell them that certain behaviors, certain, certain conduct of theirs crosses a line for us. And if they keep doing it, we're out of there. And their own people, their own families, their own kids, their wives will not get the health care that we are offering freely in that bidonville or that shanty town in port au prince it's it's um i'm watching time and there's i i knew that this conversation was going to be rough to contain within the format of future of xyz but i think what i just heard is so interesting because i hear a lot about relationships in every single aspect of what we're talking about here and i think i think if i think about the future of humanitarian aid or humanitarian action as i've heard you call it today you know, because not just aid, it is it's taking action for impact. You know, the, it's humanitarian at the end of the day. That is the that is the main word here. It's how do we help people in need? And that is about human relationships. So what you described, I think, is really interesting. And I think it sets us up nicely for, you know, kind of how I like to always, you know, kind of think about wrapping up, which is, you know, you have a tremendous experience in this space now, Avril. You know, as you look five to 10 years in the future, what is your most realistic assessment of where humanitarian aid is, is heading and, and what, what, what can we anticipate? Well, one, one file that has been slow to build and I'm really seeing it accelerate quite a lot is the humanitarian actors or the aid sector really stepping up to accompany those who have been trying to sound the alarm over climate crisis because that's what we're going to be dealing with in 10 years and we can't cope it's unreasonable to expect that humanity could cope with the devastation that all the scientists who are right are predicting uh if we don't take action to to slow things and reverse things so i would expect that in the next 10 years, uh, it, or there's going to be a ramping up of humanitarians speaking out, really trying to, to um, bear witness to what we already see on the ground, which is more drought, vector-borne diseases shifting in location because of rising temperatures. You have um, people on the move, climate refugees, uh, natural disasters, flooding. Uh, it's just going to get worse, and there's going to be more con conflict as a consequence of all these people on the move. So so I think that that's, that's the issue that I think we really need to seize upon as a sector. I, I, I get that. And, and, and in terms of what your greatest hope is, I mean, you're, you're spearheading this organization, U.S. right now. Um, there are lots of people, as you said, doing lots of important work everywhere around the world where these flare-ups are happening increasingly. Um, whether by war, whether by climate change, uh, by other, you know, natural disaster. Um, what is your greatest hope? I mean, lo looking looking to out 20 years from now, you know, 2040, 2045, what's your greatest hope for the future of humanitarian action? Well, for sure, it's it's got to do with people caring at all. Because the news cycle is such that in the U.S., there are any number of other stories that capture our attention, our imaginations, uh, tickle our fancy, distract us. And it's very hard to bring uh, attention to the kind of work that we do in the places we do it. These are largely overlooked, underreported, forgotten. And I, I worry a lot about the polarization, um, misinformation, disinformation in um, the media and in information sector generally. It's just so worrisome. But on a hopeful level, what I have consistently seen is that every time there is one of these major distractions in the U.S. or a, a shock, that um, our supporters can make that leap of empathy 
often you give to your local hospital because they treated your cancer and they'll name a wing after you or something like that. I mean, we're asking people to care about people that they will never meet uh, and who have no relevance or bearing on their daily, daily lives. lives. But on a very, on a, yeah, and on a very human level, though, uh, they, they are caring. Uh, so the the solidarity is the piece that gives me hope because I see it here. I see it on the ground. I see it with the people I'm meeting. Um, and they know that there are supporters around the world that are enabling all of this shoestring work um, to provide medical care for free uh, to people who need it most. Um, I think it's a great, a great ending point. Um, compassion and solidarity are big words. Um, and, and they are go, go contrary to the face of what, what I think you were describing before is compassion fatigue. Um, but every day, uh, your doctors and nurses and medical staff, uh, both local and international at Medicine Sans Frontières, have to make impossible choices. Um, you as an executive director and your, and your leadership team globally need to make impossible choices about where to deploy. Um, and I, I know that this is just being, you know, you are one among many aid organizations who are trying to solve fundamental humanitarian crises. Um, and I, first of all, thank you for your work. Um, uh, as, a, as a humanitarian myself, but also I think it's really important that we were able to share this story on Future of XYZ today, Avril, and I thank you for joining us for this important episode. Thank you, Lisa. And for everyone watching and listening, obviously this is a partnership with Rhode Island PBS. Uh, we are honored to have them as our collaborator. Uh, you can watch this episode if you're listening on ripbs.org forward slash XYZ. Uh, you can, if you're watching, you can listen to anywhere you get your favorite podcast. Make sure to leave us a review, five stars preferably, and follow us. You can also follow us on Instagram at Future of XYZ. Uh, Avril from uh, Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, thank you again for talking with us about the future of humanitarian aid. We will see you all next in two weeks. <laughs>